All right, we're going to get into the word here this morning, Joshua chapter 5. As you turn to Joshua 5, I want to remind you next week, right after church, is pizza with the pastor. It's my excuse to eat pizza after church with anyone who's new here. So if you're newish here, newish isn't eight years, newish is like eight weeks maybe. Um, but come, ha- come and join right after church well, in our, fir- our classroom down here. We'll have pizza, and I'd just love to get to know you. I-, I really like to get to know the people that are coming here at this church and to know you by name and to maybe you've told me your name, but I like to remember your name. Uh, and so please come and just have pizza. It's a short time. Um, there's no timeshare presentation at the end. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just pizza. All right, so just come. And there we go. There will be bad jokes. It will be fun. (laughs) All right. Jericho must fall. Let's get into the word. Uh, Let's get into the word. Now, wait, before, Carrie, we need that. We do we ask them to register, right? Yeah. Then we can order the right amount of pizza. So there's church app, Abundant Life Ordering. I'd finish my little announcement. And uh, download the app, and you can register for that uh, as well. So we can buy the right amount. All right. Into the word. We are looking at the fall of Jericho. uh, And I believe that. Uh, Jericho is a real place, of course the Bible says, but I also believe that in our own lives there are walls, there are things, there are mountains, there are things in the way that God wants to take down that are in front of us. I mean, maybe you don't have anything in your life or never have, but I think a lot of Christians have places in our lives where that are keeping us from the fullness of what God has for us. And in this series, we're looking at the Jericho walls being those places that God wants to bring down, that he wants them to crumble and so last week, Pastor Matt taught in Joshua chapter 5, as the, the armies of Israel readied themselves in purity and in holiness, set apart for what God was going to do, and that obedience of surrender to God and doing it his way made way for what happens next, that we see the commander of Israel's army meet the commander of the Lord's army. So let's look at Joshua 5, chapter uh, 5, verse 13. We're going to look at verse 13 through 15 today. It says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So we're going to look at these three verses. There is a ton packed in to these three verses. And I want to just step into the passage here and imagine what it was like to be Joshua in this moment. Joshua's out on a walk by himself. It doesn't say that everybody saw this commander of the Lord's army, just Joshua. So Joshua's out. He goes on a walk by himself. Now, I'm not sure why he was going on a walk by himself. It doesn't tell us. I have a couple of theories. My first theory is that he was going out to just spy out the land because it says he was near Jericho. So I'm wondering if maybe he was just trying to get close to get a better look. Because remember, he sent spies in and they did a terrible job and didn't come back with any information. And except for that the Lord said they were going to win, which is probably good enough. But he was either going out and doing that. My, my second theory, have you ever heard of a man cold before? <laughs> right? They had just circumcised every male in the entire land of Israel. I can't imagine just the whining and complaining that was going on in the camp. And Joshua, I think, needed a break. And so maybe he was just on a walk. That's my second theory. I don't know. Something. He's on a walk. All we know is that. And he, he comes across this guy with a sword, and the guy says, hello, my name is Nigo Montoya. You can, no, that's wrong story. <laughs> wrong story, sorry. He, he comes across a guy with a sword, and, and he says, who are you? Who is this man? Who is this man that's standing in front of me? And why was he there? Well, what we learn is that this, this man that was there with the sword was a messenger from the Lord, a messenger from the Lord. Now, a lot of people say, oh, it was an angel, and it doesn't actually say that anywhere in here. Um, What we do know, and what we've, as we study this out a bit, 
we can find that this messenger that was standing in front of Joshua was the messenger that the Lord had promised to Moses was going to escort them into the promised land. That was a promise from God way back in Moses' time. It says in Exodus 23, verse 20, it says, see, I am sending an angel. And I put in brackets messenger because that is the actual word in the Hebrew is the word messenger, and it's translated as such or angel. Uh, but I am sending an angel or messenger ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. And so this messenger shows up and it's like, hey, I'm here now. I don't know if Moses passed this message on to you, but the Lord said that I was going to come to get you, to escort you into the land and protect you along the way. And hey, I'm here now. I've shown up. It's time. And it's clear to me as I study this scripture that this is what is called a Christophany. Now, if you've not heard of the word Christophany, uh, it's just a fancy word for saying uh, Jesus present before Jesus was present. That's probably less clear. All right. We know that Jesus was born and he walked the earth as a man, but we know that unlike all of us, Jesus existed before he was born and he exists after. That Jesus has always been. And we see several different times in the Old Testament where we see the Lord, we see Jacob wrestling with somebody, somebody that can really injure him. We see Jacob wrestling with what appears to be Jesus. We see someone showing up to Gideon. And we see different times in the Old Testament where a messenger shows up that seems to be more than just an angel, more than just God's messenger, but somebody that commands the respect of God himself. And this, to me, is one of those situations in which he's called a messenger or angel of the Lord. And I want to walk you through this because this isn't just my, my hunch, but I want to tell you why. So we're going to look, I just want to look real quickly here before we get in kind of the meat of the message. Three different signs that point to Jesus here in this passage. And I think it's really cool because if you read your Bible, what you find, and a lot of people say, well, the Old Testament, you know, that was just, I don't really read that. I just read the New Testament. Here's what you need to know. It all points to Jesus, everything. The Old Testament points to Jesus. The Old Covenant points to Jesus. The blood sacrifice points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And so when we see Jesus showing up on the scene, it's, it's pretty awesome. And so the first thing that we see is that he bears the name of God. Now, in order to discover this, we have to go back to the Exodus passage that I was just in, in Exodus 23, where God said, I'm going to send my messenger. And he says this in verse 21, pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. So the messenger that God promised that I believe that was standing right in front of Joshua was God had promised to Moses and said, when this messenger shows up, just know my name is in him. Angels don't just get the name. And so his name is in him. It literally means, this phrase, the name is in him, literally means this, the manifestation of my being is in him. So this was the promise that God made to Moses, and we see it coming in to fruition in this moment. This very messenger carried in himself the name of God, the being of God. An angel can't do that. Only God can do that. Jesus. The second thing we see here is that he calls himself the commander, that he is the commander. And, and we look at this, and I, just kind of real quick, we'll just go down some Hebrew and Greek uh, lesson here. The, the, the Hebrew word for commander is sar, S-A-R, and it's translated as captain, commander, leader, etc. And the ex there's a Greek equivalent to this word. The exact Greek equivalent is the word in the New Testament, archegos, archegos. And so we see these two words, and they're interchangeable in Hebrew and Greek. The, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. But the Old Testament has been, had been retranslated into Greek as well. So you can kind of, if you dig a lot, and you can kind of find how the words are written in Greek in the Old Testament as well. We see this word in the New Testament in Hebrews 2.10. It says, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And some of her translations, captain is substituted for author, pioneer, source, or founder. That he is the founder, he is the pioneer. But the literal translation is the captain of their salvation. 
Okay, so when the Old Testament then is translated into Greek, the same word used to describe Jesus in Hebrews 2.10, the captain of salvation, is the same word we see right here in Joshua chapter 5, that he is the captain of the Lord's army. And so the captain of the Lord's army is also the captain of our salvation. So he is the, he is the commander. He is the one that is in charge. And by the way, we also see him in this role in Revelation 19, where it says that the commander of the Lord's army, if you read Revelation 19, there's, it's like a crazy, awesome novel that's not fiction, but almost seems like it because it's just out there, is you see Jesus leading, he is leading heaven's armies. He is seen as the commander in Revelation chapter 19. The third thing that I, why I believe this is Jesus, if you're not convinced yet, is that it says that his presence is holy. He tells Joshua that he is standing in a place of holiness. It's the same thing that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus 3, 5, where God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And you need to know that holy ground is reserved for the Lord. Holy ground is reserved for the Lord. Angels don't make ground holy. Just the Lord does. And what we, the, the reason why I, I go into this, the reason why I think this matters is because if you want Jericho to fall in your life, you need Jesus to show up. If you need those walls to come down, you need Jesus on the scene. You need him to show up. You need more than just your, your best friend to help you out. You need more than just a few other people. You need Jesus with you as you go and take this thing. And so many people go and try to fight things and, and fix things and heal from things without Jesus. And it's, it's either an impossible route or a much longer route or what I believe an incomplete route. You need Jesus to show up. And some of you are weary from fighting in your own strength. You need Jesus to show up. Some of you in a situation see victory as a not possible outcome. That it is a lose-lose situation. That victory is not possible. Well, you need Jesus to show up. Some of you are so paralyzed in fear by the power of Jericho's walls. And I need you to know you need Jesus to show up. And he will begin to change things. Because I know this, that a holy moment with Jesus is what prepares us for battle. It is a holy moment that prepares us for battle. Joshua recognizes this is the Lord's messenger. So he says, what's the message? I love this. What's the message? Now, if this was a football game and he was the coach, the message is we're going to run this play and you're going to go here and you're going to sweep right and then you're going to pitch back and then whatever it is. What's the message? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to want you to take 3,000 of your troops here. I want you to take 8,000 of your troops here. And I want you to take your horsemen. What's the message? The message is this. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. That's the message. That is the message. Wait, wait. You came to talk strategy, right, messenger? Like the Lord wouldn't have sent someone just to, to say that. You, you, you got some plans for me, right? You, you know where the best spot to attack is. What's the secret? Come on, I know you're here for that reason. No. Be in this holy moment. Joshua, be in this holy moment. I want you to be encouraged by my presence. I want you to know that I am with you. I want my spirit to bring you strength and courage. Would you be in this holy moment? I believe that being in the presence of the Lord is the best preparation for life's battles. Being in the presence of the Lord is the best preparation for resolving that argument that needs to be resolved. I believe that being in the presence of the Lord is the best place to be when you are dealing with the storms of life, getting in the Lord's presence. If we would just stop striving and just get into a holy moment with the Lord. And for so many of us, the busyness of our lives, it keeps us from being in that moment. Or maybe it's not busyness. Maybe it's your practical nature. Those who know me well know I'm really just practical minded. I'm so practically minded. But our practical nature keeps us sometimes from engaging spiritually. To have that faith moment with the Lord to say, God, I need you to build my faith, not my practical plan right now. Lord God, I need your presence more than I need my spreadsheet, whatever it is. I need 
I need your presence more than I need my talking points. I need your presence, Lord God, in this moment. I believe the most practical thing you can do when you're preparing to face the walls of Jericho is to get into a holy moment. When you're facing problems that you don't have answers to, when the mountain's not moving. Has that ever happened to anyone besides me? The mountain's just like, it's a stubborn one. It doesn't want to move. When the walls are too big and they're too established, get into his presence because without his presence, it doesn't happen. The answers don't come. When I'm struggling in my life, I've learned I've got to get into a holy moment. When I'm dealing with things that I, are beyond me, when I'm dealing with the stresses of life, I've got to get into a holy moment. I start to worship. I start to pray. I've got to get into his presence. And, and maybe it's stopping, God, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, and the asks. But just saying, God, I just need to just sit in your presence. I just need to hear from you. I just need to receive from you. And I will worship him, or I'll turn on some worship music, I'll open up my word, I'll just get into his presence, because that's what's needed most, more than anything. I love what Moses said in Exodus 33, verse 15. He said, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. When you are staring at Jericho, when you are looking at your mountain, that should be your cry. God, if your presence isn't you know, with me, don't send me. I don't want to go there without your presence. I can't go there. Don't try to take Jericho without the presence of the Lord. You can't do it alone, and you were never called to fight it with your own strength. You need a holy moment, because in that holy moment, the Lord prepares us for, for this fight. And in this holy moment, I believe that the Lord prepared Joshua we don't see much. It's three verses, but there's so much that he learned in this moment. So much. And I want to just share two things that he learned in this moment. And the first is this. God doesn't join our cause. We join his. That'll change your prayer life. Our society right now is consumed with sides. Absolutely you go to somebody and say, what side are you on? Are you on my side or should I cancel you? What side are you on? Like that's, that's where we're at. And then, and then to make matters even worse, people want to argue what side God is on. Hmm. <laughs> what side of the issue is God on? And Joshua says, hey, whose side are you on? I, now, now, practically speaking, as I'm putting myself in Joshua's shoes, this is a really good question because there's a man with a sword standing in front of me. And I want to know if I'm about to be cut to pieces or if I need to draw my own sword. Like, it's a really good question. What side are you on? <laughs> Do I need to get my sword out or are we good here? Have, have you ever played a team sport without uniforms? Okay, we're going to have our New Year's, well, it's New Year's Eve this year. You're welcome. You don't have to wake up early and do that. New Year's Eve football game. And inevitably, there's that one guy who's on the other team who goes out and says, I'm open, I'm open. And you throw the ball and he intercepts it and runs the other way. And you're like, that's just not cool, man. We don't have uniforms here. I didn't know what side you were on. Like, that's the most frustrating thing is trying to play a sport. And it takes a while. And I notice the older you get, it takes a little bit longer throughout the game to figure out exactly who's your teammates and who's not your teammates. And that's really what Joshua was trying to find out. Hey, dude, what team are you on? And they're like, are you just here? Like, do I know you from somewhere? Did you come to fight with us? Or you don't look like us. You don't, you don't look like an Israelite, but I don't know. Are you from Jericho? Where are you from? Did you come from another land to join us and help us take? What is it? And I think what he was trying to get to was this. See, Joshua was the commander. And he's asking this man, hey, are you here to fight me? Or are you a soldier that's ready to follow my command? And the messenger, Jesus, says, no. I'm not, I'm not here to follow your command. I'm not against you, but I'm not here to follow your command. I'm not here to join your ranks. Because Jesus didn't show up to support Joshua's cause. Instead, he showed up to invite Joshua to join his cause. Joshua, will you join my cause? 
I've got a plan here. When we look next week at this battle plan, you're going to think to yourself, worst battle plan in history. Because it practically doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There weren't a whole lot of swords. There were no weapons. There was worship. There were priests. What's going on? Because there's a spiritual battle. We'll, we'll get into that next week. <laughs> but he's inviting Joshua, will you join my cause? God doesn't join our cause, we join his. I'm not saying God's not by your side, that God's not with you, that he's for you. See, Jericho is going to fall by his hand. Jericho is going to fall by God's hand, so the battle needed to be his plan, his way. And when you are facing Jericho in your life, you've got to align yourself with God's ways. Align yourself with God's ways. Rather than arguing about who's right, who's wrong, whose side is the right side, who's got the best argument, get into a holy moment and begin to align yourself with what God says about the situation. So often, we're trying to win in situations, and we need to find out what God actually says about the situation. Align yourself with how you're supposed to pray for the situation. Align yourself with his strategy, his expectation. Align yourself with what he sees and not what you see. Because your vision might be impaired. Your perspective might not be the perfect perspective. I, I, know, I know that it feels like you're right all the time. I get it. I feel that way too. <laughs> it's just not true, and I have people in my life that have to remind me of that sometimes. But we have this perspective of self, and, and we say, this is the plan. Stop looking at my wife, Ruth. I saw you. <laughs> Here's the thing. We, we come into these things in our life, and, and we, we can only see it this one way. That we can only see the only possible thing is that I was right and they were wrong. And you realize in those moments, like sometimes I'm driving and there's a lot of people on the road that can't drive, but every once in a while, like if I'm honest, I'm like, I think I just cut that guy off. I don't think it was the other way around, right? Perspective has to get shifted, but it doesn't shift until you get into the holy place with the Lord. You get into that holy moment and you begin to align yourself with what he sees. Some of you are in a situation with another person in your life, and it's not going well. Whether that's a friend, a spouse, a child, a parent, and all you can see is how your situation and your perspective is the right one and the other one is the wrong one, rather than thinking about sides, start to ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? What's your way? Lord, how can I be a godly husband in this moment? How can I be a godly wife in this moment? How can I honor my parents in this moment? Lord, what would you have me do? Align yourself with the commander of heaven's armies. Because here's the second thing we need to know, is that heaven's armies, they come to fight. Heaven's armies will join the fight. The commander of the Lord's army showed up on the scene, and he didn't just throw out that title to impress Joshua. He was letting him know that the armies of heaven were ready to to fight. He is, as the Bible calls in the Old Testament, Jehovah Sabaoth. Jehovah Sabaoth. He is the Lord of hosts or the Lord of heaven's armies. That's what's translated in the Hebrew, the Lord of hosts or the Lord of heaven's armies. I love this story about David and Goliath. You heard that one before? David and Goliath. Anyone ever heard the story of David and Goliath? Good. It's a good story. <laughs> David told Goliath, that he was fighting two armies, not one. If you read the text carefully, it says in 1 Samuel 17, 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come with me, with, you come to me with a sword and a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Also translated, the Lord of heaven's armies. He threw out the Jehovah Sabaoth in that moment. You come I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. So Goliath, I just want you to know, you're standing here and you're mocking Israel's army, but this isn't the only army you're facing. You're dealing with the, the God who commands heaven's armies. 
See, when you're facing Jericho, you've got to call on heaven's armies. Call on heaven's armies. Mike, can you come on up and join us? They close us out this morning. When you're facing Jericho, you've got to call on heaven's armies. I don't know if you know this about in your prayer life that you can call on the armies of heaven to come and to fight with you and to come alongside you. In Psalm 46, 7, it says, The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Here's the thing about Jericho. It was the Lord's cause, and it was the Lord's armies who brought it down, and we're going to look at that next week. But I need you to know that's the same way your Jericho is going to fall. It's the same way your Jericho is going to fall is when it is the Lord's cause and it is the Lord's armies that bring it down. Your responsibility, your preparation for the battle, your strategy, your strategic planning session, your writing down what your argument and your side of the story, the whole plan, your whole plan is this, get into a holy moment with the Lord and allow him to prepare you. Allow his spirit to come upon you. Allow him to come and to meet you in the vulnerable places and get into that holy place. See, when Joshua took his sandals off, his shoes off, and stood in that holy moment, in that moment, that gesture said, okay, you are greater than I am. I recognize that you are God. I recognize that you are holy. I recognize that there's no plan that I can come up with that's better than yours. And so we come before the Lord in that holy moment. And we say, God, would you send your armies of heaven to come? Would you send them to come? But God, first, I need your perspective. I need to know your cause. I need to know your ways. I need to know what you're up to, Lord. I want to join in what you're doing. Some of you have been walking around in your life with wounds, with, with places in your life where you've been hurt, you've been wounded. Some of you have been hurt by the church, and it's kept you from really digging into the body of Christ. You've been hurt by a spouse. You've been hurt by a friend. You're dealing with things in your life. And you've got to get with the Lord and say, God, I want to join whatever cause you have. And I want to begin to start taking my eyes off my own things, my own hurts, my own right to be offended, my own right to carry this thing. And God, I know that you want to see me healed and restored. Church, you need to know that that is the cause of Christ, to see you healed and restored and set free. And if you are, are just hanging on, to these things, I need you to know that if you were to join the cause of Christ, the cause of Christ wants to see your freedom in your life. He wants to see your healing and your restoration in your life. That's the cause of Christ. Amen? So I want to pray for you. Will you stand this morning? I want to pray over you. And if you want, if you want some one-on-one -on -one prayer today, we have our ministry team that would love to pray with you. I just want to invite you to come forward as we pray. And they will pray with you about anything in your life that you are facing. But let's go to the Lord. Lord, right now we come before you. Lord, right now, you know every situation that every person in this room and every person that's watching online, you know every situation that we're facing. And you see the walls. You see the mountains. You see the things that are in the way. You see what's keeping us, Lord God. You see the hurts, Lord God. You see these places, Lord God, where we are stuck. And right now, God, we call on heaven's armies to come and join the fight. Lord, we need reinforcements. We need help. But God, we need to be fighting your cause. And so, Lord God, shift our perspective where it needs to be shifted. Show us, Lord God, what you want to do in this situation. Lord God, we wait here for a moment this morning in this holy moment. And we say we need your presence above all. We need your presence, God, in this holy moment to prepare us, Lord God, because, God, I believe victory is coming. I believe it's already been ordered. It's already been scheduled. It's already been prepared. It's already been planned. The victory for your people is already on its way. And so, God, we partner with what you're doing. We partner with you. We partner with the fight that you have in this, Lord God. Lord, we partner with your presence and with your goodness. We wait in this holy moment, Lord God, with you. And we say, God, I need your presence before I go out. I need your presence before I go face what I'm going to face this week. I need your presence, Lord God, as I stare at Jericho's walls, as they mock me. Lord, I need your presence, Lord God, to be able to take them down righteously, Lord God, to be able to face them, Lord God, and to be able to see what you have ordained in my life to come to pass. 
Lord God. We are a people, Lord God, who are waiting in your presence. And Lord, we're not going to stand back anymore and allow these things to defeat us. But God, we want to be in this holy moment with you, Lord God. And let you begin to change the atmosphere. Let you begin to shift things and change things. Oh, whatever that is in your life, church, you just lift it up to the Lord.